This is not a fear-mongering, the sky is falling type of video. Instead, this video is a cross between a the more you know public service announcement and the old adage, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Last month, the United States Secret Service found and dismantled several sim farms in New York City. While many news outlets covered this story, I didn't feel like any of them gave this story the attention it deserves. I also didn't see any news outlets offering practical advice about what people should do before and during an attack on our telecommunications network. In this video, we are going to discuss the SIM farms discovered last month and what they were capable of doing had they not been found and dismantled. More importantly, we are going to discuss what you can do to protect yourself and your loved ones from harm that might result if someone attacked our telecommunications network using SIM farms. I am Dr. John Padfield, an engineer turned state representative turned business professor, and this is Business Reform, where we discuss issues at the intersection of business, technology, and society. If you would like to support my work bringing you informative, unbiased videos, I invite you to buy me a coffee using this QR code or the link in the description. If you are new to my channel, I frequently talk about various aspects of privacy from facial recognition to surveillance capitalism to burner credit cards. But this video is going to be different as we discuss an ongoing news story and what happens if the technology modern society relies upon were to suddenly stop working. This video is different enough from my other videos that I took a poll to see if anyone wanted my take on this story, and an overwhelming 97% of the 2,000 respondents said yes. Specifically, I will explain what a sim farm is, how many have been found, what they can do, and practical steps you can take to protect yourself and loved ones from potential harm. I will then conclude this video with a brief preview of upcoming videos and live events. What is a SIM farm? A subscriber identity module, or SIM card, is a microcomputer with its own processor, memory, and operating system. They allow mobile devices such as smartphones to connect to the cellular network. While most mobile devices only have one SIM card and only allow you to make one phone call or send one text message at a time, there are other devices known as SIM banks that use up to 512 SIM cards at a time. These devices cost over $5,000 a piece, and they are legal to purchase and use in the United States, but their use is regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. The legitimate use of these devices is usually related to customer service call centers. However, these devices are sometimes used illegally to send spam text messages that impersonate your bank, Amazon, or PayPal. A single SIM bank, such as this one which will hold 512 SIM cards, can send 5,440 text messages per minute. Put 40 of these SIM banks in one location, known as a SIM farm, and those 20,000 SIM cards can send over 217,000 text messages per minute. Build five such SIM farms around New York, and collectively those 100,000 SIM cards can send more than 1 million text messages per minute, meaning everyone in the city could be sent a message in just a couple of minutes. How many SIM farms have been found? The United States Secret Service initially reported finding five SIM farms, all within a 35-mile radius of the United Nations building in New York City. Collectively, those five SIM farms held 100,000 SIM cards. Other than some photos of the SIM farms, the Secret Service has not shared much about the make and model of the SIM banks and SIM servers they seized. Assuming all the SIM banks were the 512 SIM card models, similar to this one, the people who set up the SIM farms would have needed 200 of them at a cost of around $5,400 each, for a total of a little over $1.1 million just for the SIM banks. Plus, they would have needed to buy 100,000 SIM cards and several SIM servers to control the SIM banks. They also had to pay rent on the five locations where the SIM farms were found. This means someone spent several million dollars setting up the first five SIM farms reported on September 21st, 2025. Matt McCool, the special agent in charge of the Secret Service's New York field office, said, quote, It would be unwise to think there are not other networks out there being made in other cities in the United States. Just one week later, quote, 
Agents from Homeland Security Investigations found an additional 200,000 SIM cards at a location in New Jersey. That brings us to at least six SIM farms with at least 300,000 SIM cards that have been found across New York and New Jersey, with the possibility of many more SIM farms existing in other cities across the country. What could those SIM farms do? The best case scenario, which is also the least likely from what I have read, is these SIM farms were only going to be used for sending scam text messages. Americans reported losing $470 million to scam text messages in 2024, and the actual number is likely much higher as many losses are never reported. The Secret Service is still investigating who set up these SIM farms, but there is no conclusive answer yet. All we know for sure right now is whoever did it had a multi-million dollar budget, but that doesn't narrow it down much. Going back to Matt McCool, the special agent in charge of the Secret Service New York field office, speaking about the original 100,000 SIM cards, he said, quote, It can't be understated what this system is capable of doing. It can take down cell towers, so then no longer can people communicate. You can't text message. You can't use your cell phone. McCool also claimed the 100,000 SIM cards could send up to 30 million text messages per minute, which is about 25 times what I calculated based on the specs for the SIM banks I could find online. However, I don't know what the make and model of the SIM banks were that were seized by the Secret Service, so I'm not going to argue with his numbers. While jamming all cell towers in a large city would certainly be disruptive and terribly inconvenient, it seems to me like a waste of resources if that is all the bad actors did with their multi-million dollar investment. I do not have any insider information about this investigation, but it seems to me knocking out cellular service is something a person or group would do in conjunction with some other type of attack to make the other attack much worse. For example, in January 2018, Hawaii residents received an emergency alert in all caps warning them, quote, Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Thankfully, that alert, sent by the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, was sent in error. But imagine the mass panic that would ensue if bad actors sent everyone in a major city a fake emergency alert about some man-made threat or natural disaster immediately before jamming all the cell towers so no one could make a call, send a text, or check a news website. Such a move would likely cause traffic jams that would prevent first responders from being able to get to the location where some sort of physical attack was taking place on people or critical infrastructure. Practical Steps to Protect Loved Ones There is nothing we as individuals can do to prevent bad actors from jamming cell towers and rendering our smartphones useless unless we are able to connect to working Wi-Fi. However, there are a lot of simple things we can do to make a potential loss of cellular communications less bad, and society would be much better off if we all did them. Practical step one before stuff hits the fan is to get to know your neighbors. Even the ones that had a bumper sticker for that horrible candidate the other party ran last year. I don't care if your neighbors are a different race, a different generation, or a different religion. And speaking of religion, YouTube gives me a breakdown of what percentage of my audience is from each country. I looked up the distribution of religious affiliation in each country to estimate the religious affiliation of my audience, and I want to share with you what at least two-thirds of my audience are supposed to do based on their affiliation. In the New Testament, Christians are commanded to love your neighbor as yourself. In the Torah, Jews are commanded to love your neighbor as yourself. In the Quran, Muslims are commanded to do good to parents, relatives, orphans, the needy, near neighbors, and distant neighbors. And Buddhists are instructed, quote, Just as a mother would protect her only child with her life, even so let one cultivate a boundless love towards all beings. Again, I strongly encourage everyone, of every religion or no religion, get to know your neighbors if there is ever an attack on critical infrastructure such as cell towers, your 2,000 friends on Facebook that you have never met or who live 600 miles away, they aren't going to be there for you. But your neighbors will just as you will be there for them. 
Don't let differences in age, race, religion, or politics prevent you from forming those personal connections now so you will be prepared and willing to help each other in a time of need. Practical step two before stuff hits the fan is to create a communication plan that does not rely on cellular communications. Depending on where you live and how spread out your loved ones are, your communication plan could be based on general mobile radio service, also known as GMRS, or family radio service, handheld or car-mounted radios. These radios do not use cell towers, and some of them can be purchased for as little as $26 a piece. Or you could opt for a 40-channel CB radio. I personally have a LovePod satellite hotspot that allows me to turn my cell phone into a satellite phone if cell towers ever go down. I will soon be making a video reviewing two privacy-oriented Wi-Fi hotspots, so be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications if this is of interest to you. Or you may just want to establish check-in points so your family will know where to meet or who to contact if normal communications are interrupted. Creating a complete emergency communication plan is beyond the scope of this video, but if you want to see product reviews of this type of equipment, please let me know in the comments. Practical step three before stuff hits the fan is to have some cash available as you might not be able to withdraw money from an ATM or pay for things by credit card if cellular communications are jammed. You may also want to keep a physical map of your area in your vehicle and write down or print a list of key contacts and phone numbers. I would also recommend that you never let your car drop below half a tank of gas and that you invest in some batteries and flashlights. You don't have to go overboard, but think about what you would need if you lost communications and possibly even power for 24 to 48 hours. If you are one of the 5 million Americans who sleep with a CPAP machine, you may want some type of battery backup for it. If the time comes that you lose cellular communications, especially if you received an alarming emergency alert just before the towers went down, remain calm. I have never in my life seen a situation where losing my calm would have made things any better, but I have experienced a lot of situation where losing my calm would have made things much worse. The next thing is to turn off your phone. Your phone is designed to always be connected to a cell tower with the minimum amount of power needed to reach the tower. If the towers go down, your phone will increase the power to its transmitter in a vain attempt to reach a tower that isn't there. This will cause your phone to heat up and your battery to drain quicker. You can turn your phone on from time to time to see if the towers are back online yet, but do not leave your phone on if the towers go down. And finally, check on your neighbors. Depending on their age and family situation, they may need your help and you never know when you might need their help. There are a ton of other things you can do to prepare for a stuff-hits-the-fan type of event, but what I wanted to accomplish in this video was to explain what the sim farms found by the Secret Service means to you and a few simple things you can do to help keep yourself and loved ones safe if the technology we have all come to rely on suddenly goes away for any reason. If you appreciate this type of content, please give this video a like and subscribe if you are interested in these upcoming videos. And finally, I have several live speaking events coming up in November 2025, including an event on Saturday, November 1st in Chicago, on Tuesday, November 4th in Louisville, Kentucky, on Saturday, November 8th in Ackworth, Georgia, and on Wednesday, November 19th in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Please visit BrushfiresTour.com for more details. You may have noticed I never even attempted to guess who was responsible for setting up those sim farms. That was on purpose, because it really doesn't matter. It's like someone trying to kick in the back door of your house at 2 a.m. It really doesn't matter who they are. All that matters is if you are prepared mentally and physically to handle the situation. What are your suggestions for dealing with a loss of cellular communications? I can't wait to read your comments.